Hello and welcome back to Sorted Food. Today we have teamed up with BASF for a Beat the Chef mystery box challenge and we have Michael Hustlestone up against our chef, Benjamin Ebrill. But before they go head to head, let's take a little look inside the box and see which ingredients they have to use within the challenge. Shall we? Yes. Oh, please don't. Oh, that's simple enough. Okay. We have onions, carrots, bacon, apples. I know how to use those. I think I might be okay. <laughs> now, I know what you're thinking. Are these another ingredient from Ben's allotment? <laughs> They're actually from a farm called Elden Estate. And we're gonna send both of you there to learn about the whole journey of farm to fork. And you can bring all of that knowledge back to put into your dishes. I mean, you're gonna need all the help you can get. Ooh. He's so right, right? I hate it. <laughs> the main crop grown at Elverden Estate are carrots, parsnips, onions, and potatoes. And first, we spoke with Andrew about some of the issues farmers are facing and how we can do our bit as consumers. How does consumer expectation of what a potato, carrot, onion should look like, how does that impact your job? Probably customer expectation. The biggest impact of that is food waste in the industry. Things that are perceived to be not quite right go into lower grade outlets or end up as complete food waste. And it's a real bone of contention for me because we've got to find ways of utilising food or changing our perception of yeah. food that you know we've historically thought isn't, isn't good enough. What, what can we as normals do to, to help with sustainability and to help with those issues. Buy local is good. And, you know, little things about, um, well, actually, can we drive packaging out of the system? So, is a dirty cow, if you took that home and washed it, you know, how big a problem is that? You know, you could then take out a whole load of water cleaning issues, carbon energy, because it hasn't got to be washed in the process and it doesn't have to go in a plastic bag if it's not washed. And understanding that food comes in different shapes and sizes, it naturally varies. Like we all do. Cheers for that, Ebers. Next, we learnt that one of the most innovative means to increase sustainability on a farm is through digital technologies. What is this? So what we've got here is a soil moisture probe. So that's recording rainfall or irrigation. It then measures the conductivity of the soil, which has a direct correlation to how much moisture is in the soil. So I can look at my phone uh, any time of day in any field. We've got about 90 of these in different fields and can tell exactly how much moisture is available to, to this carrot crop. And what we're trying to do is to make sure that it doesn't come under stress. So all the time we're looking at weather forecasts, trying to say, well, if it's going to rain, we don't need to irrigate. If it's not going to rain, then we need to put some irrigation on when and how often. And this, this technology is allowing us to do it. Which presumably saves the, the cost of inputs, not just the cost to the bottom line, but also the cost to the local environment. Correct, yeah. We, we have to be really conscious that every drop we take out of the environment, we've got to absolutely utilise. When you think of digital farming, what is the first thing that comes to mind? It's a huge topic, digital farming. Uh, it is all over a lot of what we do, from precision application to robots picking individual strawberries. But for me, digital farming, I still can't get my head around it, is self-steering tractors and equipment. You can sit there and it's doing the work for you. That's the kind of evolution that we've made where we're using technology to help us really accurately apply and deliver the products to fields, but you don't need to steer it. Next up, we met with Anna to learn more about precision farming. So in layman terms, what's that big red thing doing here? <laughs> so that is spraying chemicals onto our crops, um, which are necessary for crop production. So that's things like herbicides to kill any weeds. Um, it's insecticides, which kill insects, which might damage the crop. We hear the word sort of precision farming sort of spread around. What, what exactly does that mean? So that's all about reducing your inputs, it's about making sure that you're getting the most out of your crop production. So this spray is a great example of precision farming because he's got auto shut off on all his nozzles. That means when he overlaps on a bit that he's already been on, the sprayer will stop. So that means you're not getting overlap on chemical, you're reducing your, your waste in, in that term and you're also ensuring you can get the maximum efficiency out of your crop. Obviously we all know what the, the carrot, the root part is, the orange bit, but yeah. what happens to all of the field of green here? So before they're harvested, um, they'll be topped and that top just gets left on the soil. We just leave it there, it rots down, it decomposes and it, and it adds to next year's crop. 
It's wow. all very smart. Tasty carrot. Now I'm stressed. Okay, boys. The challenge here is to celebrate everything you learned on the farm by creating a dish that maximizes all of the ingredients to the full. Are you ready? Yes. Three, two, one. Cook. Godspeed. Right, <laughs> no messing around. I'm chopping up a whole bunch of things. Carrots, onions, cauliflower, runner beans, and cucumber, because I want to turn them into a piccalilli. Then I'm gonna throw them into a bowl, salt them, and leave them there for about 40 minutes. So Ebers, pick a lily, you're going for the perfect 1950s <laughs> on-trend recipe. How are you pairing that with something that maybe other people might have heard of? I saw a jar of pick a lily in the Elfden farm shop and thought, haven't had that for ages, I want to recreate it. It celebrates all the veg they grow on the farm, plus a few that I grow in the allotment. It's a spiced, mustardy chutney that celebrates vegetables because I'm gonna make a plowman's. What better way to celebrate the lunch of a farmer and the produce from the farm than a plowman's? You've already had 12 minutes, which is 10% of your time. And Mike, you have cut half an onion. Did they not have any larger onions, Mike? <laughs> I specifically picked this size of onion to prove a point. I am making a pork and toffee apple on slaw with caramel sauce and a herby vinaigrette. So think. So, 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 so Ben's created a picnic. He's taking us to a, a weird twisted fun fair. In the farm shop, I went straight to the booze, obviously, and I found this toffee apple moonshine. <laughs> Can I take pork, wrap it in bacon, drizzle it with a toffee caramel sauce using the moonshine, put it on a bed of slaw, and then top that with a vinaigrette made from the carrot tops. Now, Barry, Go as on. judges of this battle, I know we're meant to remain impartial, yep. but it sounds to me like Mike has made my perfect dish. The thing is, conceptually, yes, but he hasn't made it yet. <laughs> <laughs> Next up for the pork filling of my pasty. So obviously, Norfolk, really big on pork, so I've gone for streaky bacon, belly pork, and pork shoulder, all minced up, and I'm gonna combine it with onion, garlic, herbs, and the spices of nutmeg and mace. You know me, I love a story. So whilst I didn't have time in this battle to make necessarily a pork pie and to get the jelly as we would classically know, I thought we can do a pasty. So I'm gonna make a lard base pastry and I'm gonna fill it with a pork pie filling, but only about three quarters of it. The other quarter I'm gonna fill with apple. So it's a, a main and afters pasty in one. Ebers is back in the game. In which case I need to do the apple filling. So a couple of apples, peeled, diced, and mixed with sugar, sultanas, mixed spice, and corn flour. And the corn flour will kind of thicken it as it cooks in the pasty so that it doesn't become too wet and make the soggy pastry. So I've cut my massive onion up in half then one half into eight wedges. I fried those off in a pan, added butter, brown sugar, cider vinegar, bit of seasoning and some thyme. Fry that off for a little bit. The wedges then get flipped and the whole pan goes into the oven to slow roast. So the reason I picked this massive onion, big, big takeout for me from talking to Andrew and visiting the farm was, we as consumers have perceptions of what food should look like. If it's been grown in the right way by the right people on the right farms, any produce, whatever the shape and size, is great and gonna taste amazing. We had no idea the process onions go through before they leave the farm. It's insane. We watched literally the smartest bit of kit that just sorts onions. Two fillings done. The pastry that's going to encase it is a lard-based pastry, so more pig from Norfolk, but we've got lard melted into water, which we're then gonna pour into flour that's got an egg beaten into it. So it's got one egg, beaten in and then the hot fat and water. And while it's hot, we're gonna shape it and roll it. Boys, you've had a third of your time. Oh, what's happening here? Well, this year is all about self-improvement and learning from your mistakes. In order to beat the chef, I'm playing the chef at his own game, which is plying you with alcohol. Yes! Oh, that, that is, is delicious. 
So I'm making like a classic tasting barbecue sauce, but I'm using apples, I'm using some of my onion, and I'm finishing it off with my toffee apple moonshine, which adds like a creamy sweetness. Once that's reduced down, become nice and thick, I'm going to blend it up, season it to taste, and it's good to go. Another thing I bought, some smoked English whiskey. So this is from a distillery in Norfolk, a rarity, an English whiskey distillery. Yeah, yeah, so I thought, is. you know, my friend Jamie Spafford would like that. Um, Ebers, I'm picking up on a sense of panic about your pastry. So there is a certain time pressure with the pastry because it is a hot, fat pastry. You want to roll it out and shape it while it's warm because it does set up as it cools. Because it's got the fat, we don't need to use a floured work surface. I'm going to roll it out to a shape big enough to cut two large circles. Each of those will become a pasty. Three quarters pork, one quarter apple. Ebers, obviously pork was one of the main ingredients within the mystery box. What is it about the Norfolk Suffolk area of England that makes it so good for rearing pigs? So the soil in that part of the world, Norfolk and Suffolk, is probably much better suited to root vegetables, carrots, parsnips, uh, onions, potatoes, things like that. Less so for grass and therefore you tend not to get livestock that eat grass, cattle and sheep, and you get more of the pig poultry. Is that a hole, Ebers? Is that a hole? It's definitely a hole, boy. Hey, it makes it's, it's a hole! <laughs> <laughs> the good news about a pasty is you want a steam hole, a steam vent. Do you want four of them, the though? Yeah, do you want four of them on the side? Oh, 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 He's oh. having a <gasps> terrible this, this time. This is the good one. Why is that pastry left on the work surface underneath where your good with a bit of, was, with a bit yeah. of pig on it. That's going to be a nightmare. It's just so sticky. You, could, you should have used flour, Ebers. You don't. You shouldn't need it because it's a fatty pastry. You shouldn't need it. Well, but like, do. We are we are impartial judges here, but this never happens. Into an oven for 40 to 50 minutes, nice high temperature, and fingers crossed, we'll end up with something that comes out golden crisp and not with too much of a puddle on the bottom where the bottom pastry hasn't worked. So I've got to finely dice this. Ah, stop! My idea was to zhuzh them, and now they're a bit wet. Because I'm a solutions man, I'm gonna drain them. The reason these can't be wet is because they're going into my sausage mix to form part of the pork balls. So if there's too much moisture, it's just gonna ruin and become sticky and rubbish. Right, lads, you are an hour into your cooking time. That means only one hour left. Now the veg for my piccalilli have sorted, I'm going to boil them in a combination of vinegar, water, turmeric, ginger, and mustard seeds, just for a few minutes to soften them, then drain them out, and then I'm gonna use that liquid to create a sauce which is thickened with flour, sugar, and mustard powder. Combine it all together, let it cool down, piccalilli. My other pickle, other than the massive one that you're in now because of the pastry. Whoa! My second pickle is beer pickled onions. So I'm gonna use more onions, separate them into the individual petals of a quartered onion, and then I'm gonna quickly dump them into hot beer vinegar. So malt vinegar with sugar, juniper berry, and some herbs. And I've deliberately chosen one of the breweries that Elvedon supply their barley to. In crop rotations, you can't just grow carrots, parsnips, onions, and potatoes every year, because bit by bit, the soil struggles over years and years. So you have to rotate it with other things, other grains, other legumes. They do a lot of rye and a lot of barley in rotation. So the barley goes to the brewery to turn into malt to end up with beer, and I'm also using malt vinegar. So it's a celebration of some of their grains from the farm too. Oh, Ebers, Ebers! <laughs> no need to panic. You've got control. Ebers, there is nothing in control about that. It's pork ball time. In here I have sausage meat, diced apple, my freshly squeezed onion, which is bone dry, lemon zest, some thyme, sage, parsley, and seasoning. It's getting rolled up into balls, wrapped in streaky bacon, and then deep fried. I am so excited for this. Taking inspiration from Ebers' pastry skills, I've decided to poke these and secure them with cocktail sticks so that I don't get any holes. These are then deep fat fried for eight minutes at 160. The reason we're going a little bit lower is because they need to cook all the way through. 
So that's going to take about eight minutes. This is a slurry of flour, sugar and mustard powder that then gets dribbled into the hot spiced vinegar that we cook the veg in. That will thicken a bit like a roux and then we pour it over our veg. Boys. What's this? I've got to keep up with Mike. He's been, he's been feeding you with dousing them. Tempting, tempting treats. The difference is he bought his, whereas I've gone to the effort of making mine. So some seasonal damson plums, which I've done a rosé style maceration for two weeks in gin. Where he thinks homemade gives him the advantage, yeah. what I think is Mike's has been through a quality check. Yeah. <laughs> where, where is, <laughs> whereas we know that Ben's has been made in a bathtub. Exactly. That's quite special. Oh no, he might look like it's leaking. He's standing, looking at the oven, tapping his foot. <laughs> like Bake Off style, this is amazing. Right boys, you have 30 minutes remaining. That's tight, because I've still got three things left to do and one of those needs to go in an oven. Carrot tops are tough, so I've got to boil them and wilt them first. So I'm doing that in water, but adding some oil, capers, gherkins, salt, sugar to inject some flavour into this. Then blend it all up. I have to add some water to get a consistency right, but that should be my, my dressing. So my crisp bread is rye flour, baking powder, salt, a little bit of honey, a little bit of butter, and then brought together with water into a dough. But I'm also laying it with seeds, both in the mixture and on top. A little bit of egg white will help the seeds stick, and then we're going to bake them off. What are you using there, Rebbers? I know where you're going with this. I'm doing parsnip and carrot crisps as part of the ploughman's package. Right, so what we learned on the farm was parsnips aren't good until they've had a frost. That's when all the sweetness gets locked in and they taste incredible. We haven't had a frost yet. You're using that out of season. <gasps> what I'm using is parsnip and carrot to make salty crisps. I don't want these particular ones too sweet. This is the pickled liquid for my carrot slaw. It's water, vinegar, sugar, salt, onion, and mustard seeds. I'm gonna bring that up to the boil, and then I'm gonna dunk in my radishes and my carrots. I'm also going to boil up some carrot tops with some sugar, some water, and some salt, then add in mint last minute, and then blend the whole lot into a carrot top and mint sauce. Ooh, Ooh. nice. Okay. Coming down to crunch time, boys. 10 minutes left. Norfolk White Lady Cheese. One minute to go. 10, what nine, do now, Mike? eight, seven, seven six, six, five, four, three, three two, two, one. one. Step away from your di dishes. He spaffed it. Whew. That was a challenge. Shall we get them into the sexies and then do some judging? Please. Well, we've seen the cooking, we've heard the stories that justify it all. Shall we taste the finished products? Yes, let's do so. I feel there's lots of components. Shall I hack into some of this? Yeah, do it. Ebba, serve us up. Let's go through the pasty. No one's ever oh, cut pasty that way. What are you doing? What? You've <laughs> just destroyed the internet. Yes, but I want to show people at home. What? How backwards you are. That, well, look, you've got to see the apple and the pork. I see what he's done there. Oh. He's shown the now journey. Now you share after that. Now dig in some dig in some of the other things and just help yourself. I'll give you some green. Thank you. Cheers. 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 The sausage part of the pasty is exceptional. Almost pork pie-y. Yeah. In terms of the, yeah. the centre. That, that is, is not a Cornish pasty. No. <laughs> Parsnips feel like they're missing something, like a like a slight frost. <laughs> <laughs> For all of the panic of your pastry, I think your pasties have turned out 
really, really great. I can't believe I'm saying this, but the standout thing for me on, on that board is the onions. Something I would never have dreamt to do at home. It's also all really delicious. Are we ready for this, boys? Ready. Oh. oh. Cheers. 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 Wow. Ooh. There's elements there that are incredibly sweet and sticky. And then you've got a real tang that cuts through from that orange sauce. The sweet onion and apple in the sausage meat makes it like super moist. I'm getting peat or smoke straight oh. from that sauce. And then I'm left with the spice of the chili. It's really nice. Two very good boards. Mm. I think during the process, we saw some elements of a huddle storm. Yeah. We also saw an Ebba's Nado, which I was <laughs> not expecting. <laughs> but you've left us with a very difficult choice. Yeah. But we think we have a winner. And that winner is... Michael Mike Huttlestone. Oh, I wasn't expecting that, because that was amazing. I Toffee apple pork ball for the win. Ebbers. Well, well deserved, well played. What a journey. Well, again, we've learned so much about the ingredients that we cook with. So a big thank you to BASF for taking us on that farm to fork journey. And a big thank you to Andrew, Anna, and the rest of the team at the Elverdon Estate. If you'd like to know more about them, you can find out in the links below. We'd also love to hear from you. Comment down below, let us know. Would Mike have been your winner? Would he have beaten the chef? You can also see some behind the scenes footage of us asking the experts your questions in the description box down below. Well done, boys. It's Nicely done. Another, another excellent piece. <laughs> That's got vinegar in it. <laughs> That's going to be good for pickling. <laughs> <Ooh>. <laughs>